Thanks for listening to Church of the Open Door Sermons Podcast. Church of the Open Door is based out of York, Pennsylvania, and we exist to help everyone discover life changed through Jesus. For more information about Church of the Open Door or for locations and service times, be sure to visit us at codyork.org. Thanks again so much for listening. Well, good morning, church. I want to go on to say uh, a happy Mother's Day to all the moms uh, in the church, not only the moms that are moms, like you have kids, but also to those of you that are mothers to so many in the way that you nurture and love and support. And we value all of you and are so thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to know you and to love you and receive the love that you give so fiercely. And so we appreciate you. As I think about moms, I think about the different women that have impacted my life. And God has brought a lot of different women to have an impact in very strong ways. My life has forever changed uh, due to a bunch of women. Um, my mom, her name was Mary. Mary, uh, Mary loved Jesus and, and loved me very well. As a single mom, did a great job of uh, making ends meet and worked very hard to raise me and support and all those things that she did. And um, so my mom, I think of different spiritual moms that came alongside of me in church that helped this kid from the apartments that basically showed up in church by himself. Mom made sure I went to church. She didn't always go with me. And they came alongside and loved me and nurtured me. One of them even helped me learn how to read, believe it or not. I mean, there's the impact of people coming alongside and nurturing and using their gifts, even if I wasn't their biological son. What an honor moms have and women have to nurture in such a way, such a strong, profound way. And then, of course, um, someone, if you know me, I talk about her uh, whenever I get a chance. I had an amazing grandmother who was my nana. Anybody else you had a nana? Have a nana? It's a great name. When I think of nana, I smile because that was the kind of person my nana was. My nana got married when she was still a teenager, no ideas, anybody. Young people, no ideas for you. Different time. Still a teenager, barely finished high school. She raised seven kids. She never got a driver's license. She didn't have uh, a dishwasher. Actually, she was the dishwasher until she raised kids that washed dishes, but didn't have an electric, like a dishwasher appliance in her home until after the kids had moved out which she probably would have said it was 20 years too late. But she was someone that was very special, very modest, uh, very approachable. And though she had seven kids, you imagine she had a lot of grandkids. And having lots of grandkids and kids and people in there, and then they all get married. It just, there was a lot of us in the family. And my Nana had this profound way of loving everybody to the point that you felt like you were her favorite. Right? So we would actually argue, cousins, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually her favorite. Right, Nana? Right, Nana? Yes, you are. And then my cousin Sean would say the same thing. Yes, you are. She loved so fiercely and was so intentional about every person that was in front of her that she left this distinct mark on people because she gave a gift that people rarely give in a busy world, the gift of her attention and the gift of her care. And she didn't do it because she felt forced to do it. She did it because she was compelled to love. What a gift! And when you love someone like that in a world where we're just lacking that kind of fierce love, it leaves an impression, doesn't it? It leaves an impression. So we've had the privilege of journeying through this amazing book of Romans. And today in Romans chapter 13, we look at uh, verse 8 on down and we start off with this idea of what love really is. And what is required of us to live a life that honors Jesus with the life he's given us. So we're going to jump in verse 8 and chapter 13. And let's look at this. Verse 8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love to one another. 
For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. So I love that the Apostle Paul wants to keep things simple for us. Who likes simple? Yeah, amen. Yeah, we need simple. And God, through his grace, makes things way more simple than we do. We like to complicate things. God, in his grace and in his wisdom, likes to make things simple for us, being simple people. For example, if you go through the Old Testament, and I kind of hold this up here, there were lots of laws given for the people of Israel and those who are following God. Lots of laws. These laws were for holiness, to set them apart. These laws were to remind them of the fact that they need God for everything. These laws were set there to help them understand that they need a savior because they can't keep the law on their own. They need someone to perfectly fulfill the law. And so what Jesus does is in his lifetime, he comes on the scene and somebody asks him, hey, good teacher, rabbi, what's the most important law? So of everything in the Old Testament, all these laws, what's the most important one? And what did he say? Boy, he really helped us here. He gives two. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, love your neighbor as you love yourself. When you do that, you fulfill all the law and the prophets. Amen? Simple to understand. Today, you don't have to figure out, oh man, am I, am I violating the 47th commandment? <laughs> and have to remember all of them. No. Two commands. Two things you ask yourself. Is this honoring God? Am I loving God with my everything? And am I loving my neighbor as I love myself? And so when you are loving other people and you are owing the debt of love to other people, you are fulfilling the law of Christ. Number one, love fulfills the law. Love fulfills the law. Right before this passage, in verse actually 7, Paul talks about, and Pastor Jeremy talked about this last week, Paul, when writing to the church in Rome, says this, kind of referring to it, I'll just read it um, for you here. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. We give people what we owe them. And then he goes right in the continuing thought. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. You and I are committed by following Jesus. We've made a commitment to pay a debt with our life every day, and that debt is the debt of love. Why? Well, Jesus paid the ultimate price, the debt, out of love for you. He gave the greatest gift of love, greater than any gift you could ever give. All of us together combined could never give the amazing gift that he's given each one of us by the forgiveness of our sins. And it was love that compelled him to go to the cross. It was love that kept him on the cross while he took every sin that you've ever done, past, present, and future, upon him that you might have a right standing before God. That you could be saved today and be saved tomorrow. That you could have salvation in the life that you're living now where God saves you, spares you from things, and where you can enjoy salvation forever with Jesus and and eternity with all the church. And so because of the debt, your debt, your payment because of gratitude in your heart is the debt of love. That's what you owe. So you're not just done owing things after you pay your taxes, right? That happened a month ago. Sorry to bring it up again. That happened a month ago. No, no, no. Every single day it starts over about paying your debt of love to the people that God's placed in your life. You are indebted to God. We're obligated. Think about it this way. One of the greatest ways that we can love our neighbor as we love ourselves and the reasons why we do this is because every neighbor you have is somebody that was created in the image and likeness of God. 
Every person that you encounter was actually God's idea. And then we also know that God determines the movement of people that they might, so the people group. So where we end up, we end up. If you end up here in your county, God has you here. Why? That you could bring worship to him and so you could fulfill your mission of loving the people here in your county. It's not an accident that you live where you live and that you have the neighbors that you have and you have the people that you work with and you have the people in your home that you're called to love and to serve. It's not an accident. And we love them because that's our debt. That's our obligation to God and our debt to our neighbor. And it's also their debt to us, which means we need to allow them to love us and receive their love. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we think, oh, okay, I'm commanded to love, so I'll do that. But did you know that if your neighbor's also commanded to love, then they are going to be loving you if they're fulfilling, if they're keeping the commandment, which means you need to let them love you. Some of you stop people from loving you because of your pride. And you're not allowing them to show gratitude to God by serving you. You're withholding goodness from them or the opportunity for blessing because of your pride or your arrogance. And so just like we want to have our hands open to serve somebody, we also need to have our hands open to receive when people seek to give. And we need to also be willing to thank them. And, and as they serve me, my debt is to serve them. Not because they serve me, because I have a debt to God. I'm not, my obligation is to God. We don't boomerang give. We don't boomerang love, right? Anybody here, you've ever loved somebody because you needed some love back? You can just put your hand up like this. Because like the person next to you like, can high five you. Because that's... A lot of times our motivation when we love people is to get it back. Like, okay, I need some love. And that's true. You were, cre- you were created to love other people and to receive love, to be loved and to love. You were made for love. You're made in love, to love. And so we're made for it. And if you want to know what's wrong with our world, it comes down to a love problem. We have a love problem. Let's figure it out. Let's boil it down. Let's keep it simple. We're either not honoring God or we're not loving our neighbor. When you, mess up, when you mess up those two things, you've messed it all up. What is the problem in your home? It's either loving God well or loving your neighbor well. Aren't you glad he makes it simple for us? We make it so complicated. Just unpack it enough and it gets back to one of those two things. And when we do those things with God's grace and his spirit working in us, we fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 10, love no, does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm to the neighbor. So he mentions above that, that there's commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not, not, shall not murder. Don't steal. Don't covet. And whatever other command there may be is summed up in the one command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the way that you can get a sense of whether or not you're loving well is are you bringing harm to them? So there's the the, uh, sins of commission and omission. So there's the idea of that I can willfully sin and I'm thinking, I'm planning, I'm doing that. Then there's also times that I'm not guarding my heart and my life and so sin is happening, Right? There's a times where uh, you're not keeping things in check. You're not walking in the spirit. And so it's very easy to kind of go back to default or autopilot. Who knows what I'm talking about? And the same is true when it comes to loving other people around us. There are so many times where we're all caught up in our own head that we're missing opportunities because we're not even thinking about it. And then we realize, oh, man, I missed an opportunity. Well, you can get a sense of how that's going by if you're harming your neighbor. If you're loving your neighbor well, you're not bringing them harm. One of the beautiful things about our Savior Jesus, as he looks at you, he looks at me, and every other person that he saw, he saw every person as lovable and redeemable. It's, it's the vision by which we all need to have. 
Every person in your life is lovable. Every person in your life is redeemable. Some of you are sitting next to people that you prayed that God would do a miracle in their life, and here they are with you this Sunday morning, redeemed. Amen? Every person's lovable. Every person's redeemable. What might be impossible for us is possible with God. So as we're seeking to love people, sometimes we just need help figuring it out. Like, how do I love people? And a good question for us to think about is this question, like, it goes like this. What does love require me to do in this situation? And so if you're in a situation and you're not sure what to do, we ask ourselves, ask yourself the question, what does love require me to do right now? In this moment, my response, what does love require me to do? So what does love require me to do when I'm really busy but somebody needs my help? What does love require me to do? What does love require me to do when someone needs to be prayed with, but I don't know how to pray or what to say? What does love require me to do? Do you know how many opportunities, Christ follower, you have every day to stop and pray with people in your life? I mean, if, you just pay, if we just paid attention when people are talking about their hurts, and you leaned into it because that's what Jesus does. He leans into our hurt. He leans into the people's hurts. Read through the gospel. If you just took a moment to lean into their hurt, practice um, some um, empathy in the moment where what it would be like to go through what they're going through and just say, hey, can I pray for you? Because I know a lot of times you say, I'll pray for you. And then you forget. Anybody guilty of that? Or you pray right away, but then you forget, which that's okay. At least you kept your promise that you pray for them. Better thing is keeping on praying for them and then checking up on them, right? But what about in that moment you just stopped and prayed for them right there? Like you run into somebody at Target and they talk about something they're going through that's really difficult. And you say, hey, can I pray for you right now? Do you know how how life-giving that is? to that person in the moment? Who's ever had somebody stop and do that for you? Is that not encouraging? Like pouring courage into you gives you courage? What does love require me to do in that situation when someone needs to be prayed for? What does love require me to do when someone cuts me off in traffic? Oh man, I know, I'm meddling now. (laughs) What does love require me to do when someone cuts me off? I'm not asking what your flesh wants you to do or what you've done before. No, what does love require me to do? Am I going to forgive them in that moment? It's remarkable how many times in life we take things so personally that we don't stop and think about what the other person's going through that would cause them to do that. You don't know the person, like, you don't know the day that the person that cut you off is having. If they're having a good day, a bad day, are they on their way to the hospital? We don't know that. And so if you need to fill in the blanks, just assume that every person is lovable and redeemable. And in that moment, pray for yourself. Amen? I mean, come on, it starts with you. It's your attitude. <laughs> and then you start, for the other per- you start praying for the other person. And if they have a COD bumper sticker on? <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't be you guys. None of us would ever do that. What does love require me to do when someone cusses me out because of something I did or didn't do? Oh, man, it's, tempt- it's tempting when someone goes at you at full force to return with more force. Right? Right? It happens in your home. It happened last week to some of you. You went in with some force. The person was like, oh, yeah. And then suddenly things escalate. There's a better way to live. There's a better way to live. Unfortunately, some of our families 
have this generational curse that that's what happened when you grew up, and so you've brought that into your family, and you've gotten really good at it. And it's time to invite Jesus back into your home and back into your conflict and back into all the other things and invite Jesus to have a seat at the dinner table. And how would you treat that person in your home if Jesus Christ was sitting right there? He is. There's a better way. What about one um, where some of these might not have hit with you? This might hit all of us. What if you don't get the appreciation you think you deserve? Or someone hurts your feelings. What do you do there? What does love require you to do when you've done everything you could and you just want to thank you? You just want acknowledgement that you're doing a good job. What does love require you to do in that moment? Well, maybe it's a conversation. But it starts with prayer, asking for wisdom. Maybe it's, it's I'm not sure what to do, so I go to a good friend who's, who's older than me and I trust their opinion and I say, hey, what do I do here? What does love require you to do? We have to stop and ask ourselves, what does Jesus want me to do in this situation? And that's what love would require. See, our love for others sets us apart. Our love for others sets us apart. See, we're called to live differently. And when you are in Christ, you're just built different. And you have to remind yourself that you're now built different in Jesus Christ. You don't have to live like everybody else in the world. We're called to be different. We're called to be difference makers. You can't make a difference in someone else's life if you're just like everybody else. We've been called to be holy, which means set apart, which means there are things that we're going to do that's going to set us apart from other people. And it should be marked by love. Verse 11, and do this. So, and do this. (laughs) Talking about love. Understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. That's so true, isn't it, church? The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. If you're just in autopilot, it's time to wake up. If you're just wasting away the time and you're not making the most of your day, it's time to wake up. In fact, every morning when you wake up is a new day for you to chase after God because his mercies are new every morning. Amen? And every night when you go to bed, you ask yourself two questions as you evaluate your day. You don't say, how much did I check off my to-do list? That's not first. Good to have goals. All that's great. But you can accomplish a lot and still lose your soul. You can gain the whole world and still lose your soul. You can get a lot done and still not make an impact in this world for Jesus Christ. And your boxes are checked. No, every night before we go to bed, we ask God two questions. It's very similar to what we do when we celebrate communion together. Jesus, how did I do today loving you with my everything? And what do I need to repent of right now because I didn't do that? And thank you that you forgive me. And Jesus, how am I doing loving my neighbor as I love myself? Is there someone I need to make right with? Someone I need to apologize to? Is there a text message I need to send right now? Is there someone I need to call tomorrow? Is there a lunch I need to schedule? Whatever it takes, every day we evaluate our life on those two big questions. God, how am I doing in my walk with you? How am I doing in my walk with other people? We have to wake up to the reality that time is short. Time is short. We're reminded of this all the time. And the older we get, the more we're reminded, right? So as Jesus followers, we are members of his kingdom, which means we're not of this world. And so we have to stop living like everybody else. We've been called to live differently and that there's a better way. The better way is putting on the armor of light. Philippians 4 says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There's something about putting on 
the armor of light or the spiritual armor that God has given us that will protect us and guard our hearts. It protects us from ourselves sometimes. And it sets us free so we can freely love and serve Jesus Christ. So this armor of light that's mentioned in verse 12 is set up to guard us as we live our lives for Christ, to guard you as you live your life for Christ. So how does this work out? Well, uh, put together an acronym to help us, and a lot of verses from Romans make this up. The acronym is the word guard. Number one, if you want Jesus to guard you and the light, his armor, the armor of light to guard you, number one, it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Term for this is get saved. The idea of being saved is you're being saved from your own self and your own destination, which is hell, on your own, without Jesus. And that salvation that God wants to give you is freely given through the blood of Jesus Christ and you realizing that you need Jesus for everything. Amen? Everything. You need him to save you today from your own self and to save you for better living. And then we need him to save us for eternity. And so it begins with a relationship with Jesus where we confess our sin to Jesus. We ask him to forgive us of our sin. We ask him to move into our life to be the Lord and leader of our life. So it starts with getting saved. Then it goes to using the spiritual armor of God. Ephesians 6 unpacks that and we'll be able to study that um, not too long from now as a church. Looking forward to that. A, avoiding evil practices is the idea that We want to serve Jesus with everything, so we're going to avoid those things that are sinful in our life, that are evil. Then we resist the devil as we're doing this, and we draw near to God. Every day we draw near to God. These things lead to holiness. See, a lot of times what happens is we start off in our life, and as we go through the day, if we're not mindful of how we're living our life, then we can get caught up living in what the Apostle Paul calls the deeds of darkness. The deeds of darkness. And unfortunately, we put on the deeds of darkness. We put on the deeds of darkness. We're not even thinking that we're putting it on, but that's what's coming out of our life. Disobedience, arrogance, pride, jealousy, immorality. The list goes on and on. And though as Christ followers, we've been called to put on the armor of light, But you can't put on the armor of light while you're still wearing the deeds of darkness. Look here at verse 13. Let us behave decently as in daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension, which is fighting and jealousy. So he gives us these lists here of things not to do. And when you and I are practicing these things, we're basically putting on an outfit that we should never be wearing in the first place. And this outfit, these things that God tells us not to do, we put on, and unfortunately, like an old jean jacket, it just kind of fits. It just kind of feels right sometimes. What I mean is the person cuts you off. Sometimes it just feels right to yell at the person and then try to get back at them. Am I right? It's comfortable It's our default sometimes, sadly. So why is the Apostle Paul talking to them? Because, listen, these people living in Rome, they were carousing. They, this was, these were Christ followers. This letter was written to the church. It's written to me and you right now as people that make up the church, Christ followers. And these Christians were living like everybody else outside. In the world, they were carousing in drunkenness. So they were seeking pleasure and alcohol and in drugs and in partying. And we know that this lifestyle, Christian, wrecks your testimony for Jesus. It wrecks it. You lose the credibility when you're living like everybody else. It's sad, but it's, it's true. You lose the opportunity for greater impact when you're numbing yourself to escape your pain. We all have pain. It's just part of life, sadly. But there's a better way. Instead of numbing our pain, we go to Jesus with our pain. We ask Jesus to give our pain 
purpose. And we go around other people that can surround us. Many of them have already experienced our pain, maybe a little bit before us, so they can help us. But when we get into this difficulty of carousing and drunkenness, we end up kind of in this cycle of self-destruction. And it seems glamorous, it seems fun at first, but we slowly spiral downward, wrecking relationships, wrecking our finances, our career, our health. And sadly, typically, the, sadly, the person who is in that lifestyle is the last to see how damaging it is for them. He goes on to say, not in sexual immorality and debauchery. This is sexual sin, church. We can't live like everybody else, but because we know that God created sex for something awesome and not to be cheapened. He built a fence around it, and it's called marriage. And it's for enjoyment in a marriage and to have kids. Amen. Amen. Look around. It's awesome. And when we, when we pervert that, you end up having all kinds of drama that is unnecessary and a world of hurt. And it happens in our families. Families are torn apart because people aren't practicing this. Christ follower, we are built differently. There's a better way. And this was so familiar to the church, to the Roman Christians, because the ruling classes of Rome were famous for all these things. And the lower classes copied their behavior. And the same is true for the church in Corinth. So they didn't just get one letter, the church of Corinth, they got two. And probably other ones written to them that's not recorded in Scripture for us. Right? And so what happens in Corinth, and what happened in Corinth, happened in Rome. And Christ followers, you might say, well, that doesn't fit us. Well, no, actually it does. Because a Corinthian church and a Roman church creates a, uh, I'm sorry, a Corinthian culture produces a Corinthian church. A Roman culture produces a Roman church. An American culture produces an American church. And we got to figure out where God fits in all here. And obviously he has to be the front seat here. And so we seek to honor God, not culture. And we produce in our own home, our own godly cultures, where we practice what it means to be light in a dark world. There's a better way. It's not in strife. It's not in jealousy. And it's interesting. So some people look at this list and say, wow, I can see the first two in there. What about the last two? Well, like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Paul is talking about these sins and how they all lead to worse things or can lead to worse things. They're bad and it can spiral to be worse. So Paul considers attitudes as important as actions. So just as hatred can lead to murder, so does jealousy lead to fighting and lust to adultery. When Christ returns, he wants to find his people clean and living differently. Verse 14, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think how to desire or how to fulfill or gratify the desires of the flesh. And so what we need to do every single day, every day, is put on Jesus. Every day we put on Jesus. We don't miss a day. Every day we are putting on Christ, which means we got to take something else off. Because these two don't, they don't live together. You're either choosing to put on one or you're choosing to put on the other. And Christ follower, we've been called to put on Jesus. We've been called to wear Jesus. We've been called to clothe ourselves. And I love this. It's with the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think Paul put the word Lord here? Well, the word Lord means dominion. If someone is a Lord, they have property. They're in charge. They're the boss. Everyone submits to them. When you put on the Lord Jesus, you're saying that Jesus is in charge of your life. He's your everything. You make 35,000 decisions every single day, which is why you're so exhausted at night. Amen? And some of those decisions are in autopilot, like how you get to work sometimes. You're not even sure how you got there. And everything else. Well, in those 35,000 decisions, you have to put on Jesus. You have to. What does Jesus think about this? Is this honoring God right now? 
Am I honoring God? Because there's a collateral to all of our decisions. They all have an impact. Some very small. You make the decision not to put on deodorant. It impacts other people. It might impact your social life. Right? And there's the frivolous like that. Maybe not as frivolous. And there's the things that really have impact. We are to clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. So what does this look like to put on Jesus? Well, it involves putting on holiness. The word holy means set apart. We have our holy Bible, which means set apart book. We are called to be set apart, which means we're set apart from the world and set unto God. We're separated for God. That's holy. It's this idea of pursuing what it means to be godly. It's always prompted by love, not by good works, but by love. Love is the fruit of good works. So our good works is the fruit of love. And so if I'm loving people, good things are going to happen. I'm going to do things to serve them. But the motivation always has to be love. Love for God, love for other people. This sets us apart. Pursuing holiness means spending time in the word every day, spending time in prayer, being part of spiritual community, looking for ways to serve my neighbor and being involved in serving in my church, and then getting rid of opportunities to gratify the flesh. These things are essential to godly living. And so just like we ask ourselves the question, what does love require of me? We have to ask ourselves the question, what does holiness require? require of me? What do I need to stop doing and then start doing? Because you got to replace it. So whatever thing you need to stop doing that is sinful, that is distracting, that is a weight that you need to cast off, cast off, then you need to replace it with something that's way better for your soul. Amen? What does holiness require of me? Someone that understood this firsthand because he walked with Jesus was one of Jesus' best friends, John. And I'll read from 1 John real quickly. And if you would do me a favor and just bow your head. And I want to read this verse over us for our encouragement and our joy. It says this, This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As your head is bowed, are there deeds of darkness today in your life that you need to confess and give to Jesus? Do you need to confess the fact that you know you need to put on Jesus Christ and his lordship in your life? And then you need to cast off all the deeds of darkness and all the unrighteous things that you've allowed to creep into your life. And if you need to do that as I pray, I would invite you right now to repent of anything you need to repent of. Simply saying, Jesus, I want to go the opposite direction. I want to, instead of running towards these addictions, I want to run towards you. Instead of running to these things that mess up my soul and my relationship with you and other people, I want to run to you, Jesus. And I want to run to the people that love you that you've placed in my life. Let's pray together. Jesus, we come to you now. So thankful that not only do you tell us to repent and what to throw off, but you also forgive us freely when we do that. Jesus, I pray that you would help every single person that can hear my voice have a desire to wake up, to love their neighbor as they love themselves, and to throw off the deeds of darkness that are so easy, easy to give into. Jesus, we repent of our sin. We repent of the areas of our life where we are just constantly, constantly failing to honor you in, Jesus. And we declare right now that we love you. We want to serve you with the rest of today, the rest of this week, and the rest of our lives until you return or take us home. Help us to practice love, to wake up, and to put on you, Jesus Christ, every single day. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. Thanks again so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, would you consider going and subscribing and sharing? 
We hope that we can help everyone discover life change through Jesus. And again, for more information on Church of the Open Door, you can go to codyork.org. And you can also follow us on social media at codyork. Thanks again for listening.